Well, this evening we're going to see that Jesus, or at least be reminded, that He's not only the one who uh, provides salvation, He's the only one also who can actually give it to us. Uh, What I'd like to do is uh, now read just a portion of um, John chapter 17. I'd like to read verses 1 through 5 again, but this evening we're just going to be looking at verses 2 and 3. Um, remember, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer. This is the prayer that, well, that basically the, the Lord the Father has answered in the founding of His church. This is Christ's prayer for His, his people. This is prayer for us, uh, the one that actually has been fulfilled in us if we are trusting in Him. And um, I think we're going to see that uh, not only does it display a great deal of love that the Lord has for us, but it also is going to show us the great blessings that He has actually brought down to us uh, through His work. So let me read uh, verses 1 through 5 again, but again, we're just going to be looking at verses 2 and 3. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that the Son may glorify You, even as You gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom You have given Him, He may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And the Lord bless His Word again to our hearing this evening. Now, this morning, again, remember, we saw the first request that our Lord made in His prayer for us, that the Father might glorify Him. And what He had particularly in in mind here, I believe, uh, was everything that Jesus needed in order to reach that place of glory, which we read about in verses 4 and 5. Jesus being Man, of course, being God as well, He is uh, the person is a divine person, but the nature is a human nature. Being dependent upon His Father, was looking to His Father for the strength to be able to make it through what it is He had called Him to do, to take this path of suffering and death so that He might glorify His Father. Remember, Jesus was asking things for Himself, but His ultimate goal was that He might bring glory to the Father, which, again, is the example we are to imitate. Um, That is our purpose, to give glory to Him. The things we ask should also have that same purpose. Jesus wanted to glorify the Father, and the way He did it, of course, was by vindicating His justice. How could God forgive anyone unless there's a sacrifice? Well, there hadn't been a sacrifice up to that point that could forgive sins. Jesus offered it and vindicated God's justice, that He might be just, and that He might also be the justifier of the one who puts His faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is able to declare just those who trust Him who are not personally righteous, that is our condition, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the free gift of His Son's righteousness given to Him. So basically, Jesus glorifies His Father through His work by allowing Him to be one who could bring His people to heaven and be just in so doing. Now, this evening, we're going to look at the reason that Jesus gives um, in His prayer to His Father, the reason why His Father should hear Him, the reason why His Father should answer Him. And it's based upon the fact that He has already given Him the authority, which brings with it a certain glory and honor, of being the one who would give the blessings of the work He was doing, the blessing of eternal life, to those whom the Father had given to Him. Uh, Jesus then goes on to describe what this blessing is, that the Father has given Him the privilege of giving to others, and that is a relationship with the Father and with the Son. Uh, These are the two things that I want us just to focus on for a few moments uh, this evening. So first of all, Jesus bases His request to the Father to give Him the strength to complete His work 
on that honor that the Father had already given to him to be the giver of eternal life. Again, let's read verses 1 and 2. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Now notice again, Jesus bases his request for the strength to complete the work of salvation because the Father had already promised to him that he would be the giver of this salvation. Lord, you've made me this promise that I would be able to bestow salvation. Uh, give me the grace to be able to complete that work so that I can do this. Now, we know the Father, of course, has many reasons why He hears His Son and why He should answer Jesus' requests, uh, not the least of which because He loves Him and He hears everything the Son uh, offers to Him, as we saw this morning, because the Father loves His Son, the Son loves Him, and He does all His holy will. He should do it because Jesus is worthy of this honor, uh, because He is the Son of God and because He has done this work which the Father promised, again, that He would reward Him for. But again, He should do this, Jesus says, on the basis of the honor and the authority He had already promised Him. We believe that, I mean, we have, well, this has to be the case. This is an honor that the Father promised Him in eternity, before the world was created, in what we would call the everlasting counsels of God as a reward for His work of redemption. Remember, the Son promised He would do certain things or agreed He would do certain things in this arrangement, and the Father, in return, promised to give Him certain rewards. Well, one of the benefits that He would give to Him is that He would be the one who would give eternal life. So the benefit of the work he was completing for his father's honor, the very work that he had been asking the father for the strength to complete, he's asking him to do so that the father may grant to him, or because the father has granted to him, that honor of bestowing that blessing. Now the authority that he promised Jesus in this eternal arrangement, I think we have to see, as we look at the rest of Scripture, extends beyond uh, this particular honor, and I think it would help sort of our expand, expand our understanding of Jesus and the honor which the Father has bestowed upon Him, if we think about that for just a few minutes. It goes beyond this particular honor of being the giver of eternal life, but it really extends to an authority over all of creation. Our Lord Jesus Christ for this work, and again, when we're, when we're thinking about the rewards given to Jesus, remember, we're, we're not talking about what was already His as the Son of God. The fact that He was God, the Son of God, means He already had all of these blessings. He had all this authority. He was the one who originally created all things from His divine nature, speaking them into existence. But when these things are said now to be given to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is given to the one who is the God-man, the mediator, it is bestowed upon him as an honor given to him for his work. Well, what are those honors? Well, he was to be given control of the entire universe, sovereignty over all the angels and all the demons, including Satan. Uh, he was given authority over all the creatures of this world, and, and the creatures of the world includes the world itself not just the planets and stars and so forth, but this particular planet. Everything that occurs in this world, all what we call natural occurrences, as well as the events that actually take place in this world, he was to have control over all these things so that he might govern them and that he might dispose them and use them and cause them all to work together for his good ends and purposes for his church. Remember, Jesus' ultimate goal is that he is gathering people together in order to bring to heaven. He's given control over all things in order that he might do that. Now, this is what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. This authority is absolute. 
Jesus is in control of all things. There is nothing outside of His control. This is what Isaiah had in mind, what he was referring to when he wrote in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, which is a passage we often read around uh, the time of Advent, Christmas, the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And this is also what the author to the Hebrews had in mind where he wrote this regarding Jesus in chapter 1, verse 3. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of His nature, and upholds all things by the word of His power. You see, Jesus has all authority. Jesus has the government of basically everything resting upon His shoulders. He is the one who upholds all things, and by that, the author to the Hebrews means two things. He means that Jesus is the one that keeps us and all things that we see in existence he is exerting divine power to keep everything in being. We, we're not independent. We, we don't, can't exist apart from God. We need the Lord uh, to keep us, as it were, in being. But it means even more than that. It means that He is the one who is moving all things along according to God's plan. He is the one who is controlling history. He is the one who is moving history along to its end. That is what God has planned. He is the one who is in absolute control. And, and by the way, we need to understand that in terms of how the Bible describes it. God is not the author of evil. Jesus is not causing people to do evil. He is holding all things up in existence, giving people the ability to do what it is they do, but they are responsible for what they do. But He is using everything that is being done for a specific purpose, and that is for His glory and the glory of His Father. Now, in Jesus' request here, in this particular prayer, He points particularly to that authority the Father has given Him over the souls and bodies of men, over all flesh, over all Jews and Gentiles, those the Father has chosen as well as those He hasn't chosen to do with them what He wills. Now, that is, is something that um, is true, something the Bible talks about. God is absolutely sovereign. He is the one who can use His creatures for whatever His purposes are. We know that He always does what is good and He always does what is right. But even more specifically, Jesus points to that authority that the Father has given to Him to grant eternal life to those He has chosen, that is, to the elect, to grant to them eternal life. Now, we're going to look in just a few moments a little more closely at what eternal life is. But we need to understand here uh, at least that He has the authority, Jesus has the authority over the eternal destination of every man and woman and child in the world to give or not the forgiveness of sins, His perfect righteousness, and a title to heaven. Jesus, as we sang just a little bit earlier, is the fountain of life. He is the source of of redemption. He is the only way to heaven. I think we saw something of that this morning as well. There is no other way. Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but or except through me. Jesus is the only way. He's the only one who's done the work. He is the one, as we see here, who has the authority to give the benefits of this work. Now, one other thing we want to see here is that this authority that the Father has given to Jesus Christ is not divorced from His Father's will. It's, it's, and, of course, we really can, can never think of Jesus ever going against the Father. The, both of them work in, in perfect harmony. He has been given this authority, Jesus tells us in our text, to give this life 
to those whom the Father has given to Him, and only to them. Now, who are these people? Well, they are the ones the Father has chosen. They are the ones that He has determined to give to His Son. Those who are His by covenant. Those the Father promised to give to Jesus for His work as a reward for all that He's done. That's actually what we just read in Isaiah 53. Remember that the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. And it's talking about those whom the Father had promised to give him for his work. Now, if you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've turned from your sins, if you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, you are one of those. You see, one of those chosen. If you have, then... The following descriptions of those who were chosen throughout Scripture, basically those different descriptions, which all, each one of them has, has so much meaning, these describe you. You are called in the Bible His people. You belong to Him. He is your God. You are His people. You are His sons and daughters, the sons and daughters of the living God. And of course, the very common term that we often think of, the elect, those who have been chosen. Jesus calls them His sheep in John chapter 10. They are the ones for whom He lays down His life. You are His sheep. You are His branches. We saw in John chapter 15, the branches that are connected to Him, the ones engrafted into Him by faith through whom His Spirit flows that you might bear His fruit. You are His body, His extension into this world, the, one, well, the ones who, who do His work. You are his, his bride, the one whom He loves, the one that He is married to. You are the temple that He has built to offer up spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to Him. Now, Jesus has been given the privilege of giving the life that, that He earned by laying down His life to whom He wills, and He wills to give it to you, that you might be his spouse, that you might be his treasure, that he might save you, that he might enjoy you, that you might enjoy him, that he might care for you, and that he might make sure that you arrive in heaven. Basically, that's what Psalm 23 is talking about, how the Lord <clears throat> watches over his sheep. <clears throat> and remember, these sheep are his people. These sheep are his chosen. These sheep are his elect. These sheep are you, you see. And He has said that there is nothing in heaven and there is nothing on earth that will ever separate you from His love. And the reason why He can guarantee that <clears throat> is because <clears throat> the Father has entrusted to Him all power and all authority over all creation to make sure that He never loses you. Now, this is the honor that the Father has already given to Him. And on the basis of that privilege, he prays that the Father would strengthen him to carry out the work that was necessary to bring this about. If Jesus had not laid down his life, if he had not given himself, he could not bestow something that didn't exist. He had to die so that we might have life, so that he might give us that life. So Jesus reminds us again, as I've said in verse 2, this is his argument of why he should give him the strength, because he has given him the authority to give eternal life to as many as he, the Father has given to him. But what exactly is this life that the Father has given him the privilege of bestowing? Well, here's where we just begin to scratch the surface because we're not going to be able to look at everything that's entailed, so we will just scratch the surface. We do know it's more than just a better condition of life, better than what we deserved, because remember what we deserved. We were looking forward to an eternity in hell, an eternity in torment. And yes, hell is a very real place. The people who go there deserve to be there. We deserve to be there as well. Okay, that's what we have earned by our works, which is why we can't get to heaven by our works and why we need the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, eternal life means the Lord has given to us something better than that, a better condition of life, uh, an eternity of blessing a place where there will be no pain, no suffering, 
no death, no sickness, but only perfect love, perfect happiness in the presence of God, in the presence of the Lamb, in the company of, of a perfect congregation, uh, company and companionship of our brothers and sisters in the Lord who have been made perfect, and of the holy elect angels. We're going to a much, much better place. Now that, you know, heaven between now and, and the consummation of all things, but the new heavens and the new earth, and what that's going to be like, we can only imagine as the whole creation is basically purified and brought back to its pristine condition with God again living on earth as He did originally in the garden. He will again be with His people, wipe away every tear, and we will be with Him forever. Now, I just also uh, previewed the second thing. It's more than just merely a length or duration of life. Continuing to live in this condition for countless eons of time in this world of perfect love and happiness, which would be great in and of itself, because when you really stop and think about it, I mean, what, what is better, and we're going to see what is better, and really what this means when we consider what eternal life really is, than being in a state where you're so perfectly happy and full of joy and love that you're, you couldn't contain any more than what you already experience. I mean, that's what we're all seeking for in this world, and the only way we can actually find it is in Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can give it to us, even though we forget that sometimes and we begin to look for it in other places, but we only get a taste of it here, and that's better than anything the world has to offer. Here it's going to be full. Well, it includes these things, but it includes more than these things. Eternal life is a relationship our Lord tells us, a relationship that Jesus gives, a relationship with the Father and a relationship with Him, one that involves more than just knowing about them, but one that involves knowing them. He says in verse 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, we do need to understand here, we need to make sure we don't make the same mistake that, that a number of Christians make today, that eternal life is simply knowing about Jesus. I, I know the facts, I believe them, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, I prayed the prayer, I did what I was supposed to do, and now that's all there is to it. But well, there's much more to it than just that. What Jesus speaks of here is so much more than simply knowing about God. You know, everybody knows about Him. You can learn so many things about God just by going out into the creation and walking in the woods, you know, and seeing His handiwork, or walking at night under the stars, and I mean, that's especially when you get away from the city lights and you get to see everything that's out there, it's just astounding. You, know, you just feel impressed by the power of God. You can learn a lot about God today by looking through a microscope or looking through a telescope. You can learn a lot about Him simply by examining yourself, looking at your body, how we're fearfully and wonderfully made, looking at your mind and how it works, looking at your soul. All of these things are basically revelations about God, and everyone has them. Everyone has so much information about God that there's nobody in the world who has an excuse for not believing in Him because they all know about Him. Romans 1.20 for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. There is no one in the world who has an excuse for thinking that God doesn't exist. Everyone knows about Him. But even though everyone knows about Him, most people do not know Him. Now. You can also attend a church week after week, year after year. You can go to a Bible college. You can go to seminary and you can study year after year and learn a great deal about God but still not know Him. You know, there's a lot of people who have done that, people who have devoted their lives to studying the Bible and writing books and commentaries about the Bible who are as far away from God as the people of the world who have never actually seen the Bible, who do not know Him. Now, we do need to know about Him if we are to come to know Him, but 
knowing about him is not the same thing. Now, Jesus here is speaking about a personal relationship that we can have with the Father and the Son. And I've used this illustration before, so bear with me because I think it's a good one. But R.C. Sproul describes this difference as the different ways in which a political analyst may know the president and the gardener at the White House may know the president. Political analyst is like the theologian who doesn't know the Lord, who just studies the Bible and so forth, who studies the president. And he knows the president in a certain sense. He knows about his life, his background. He knows his character. He knows his education. He knows his policies. He knows a lot about the president. While the gardener often speaks with him and knows him on a first name basis, has a personal relationship with him. Now, both men are said to know the president in a certain sense, but between the two, only the gardener has a relationship with him because the political analyst has never met him. So what does it mean to know the Father? What does it mean to know the Son? Well, it means many things, actually. And Jesus, I believe, throughout this um, prayer is going to tell us just what exactly it means. But I think perhaps the final verses of this prayer summarize it in verses 25 and 26. Jesus says this, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, Jesus here is speaking about a particular intimacy that only the people of God have with the Father and the Son. And I believe it really boils down to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, this intimacy is a love relationship. And it, it is a love created by the Holy Spirit. It is a love that basically, well, is, is the love of God in our souls for God. Uh, Jesus describes it in, in such a way that it, it, if we don't understand it properly, we might actually end up thinking that somehow, well, I'm sure there have been people who have, that somehow we become part of the Godhead, but that certainly is not the case. I know the Worldwide Church of God, is, which is a, a cult, I think it, it's split and there's people who hold to the old beliefs and there's people who have actually embraced something closer to biblical Christianity, but they actually believe that by following this particular religion, that the Godhead, which we know contains three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, actually gets a lot of more people added to it. Now, that's not what Jesus is talking about here, even though it may sound a little bit like that. But listen to what he says in verse 21, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, Jesus here again, and, you know, it's like I said, it's take a little while to understand exactly what this means, but he is speaking about an intimacy that we have, an intimacy of relationship that comes through the Holy Spirit. Uh, just by way of preview, again, I think Edwards was on the right track when he said, the Spirit of God is basically that love the Father breathes out towards the Son and, and that the Son breathes out toward the Father. It's what binds them together in, in this relationship. The Father extends that same relationship to us. Jesus came into the world, did the work that He did, redeemed us so that we might be His children, so that we might be His bride, so that He might love us, uh, so that He might bring us into an intimate relationship uh, with Himself by giving to us His Holy Spirit, by placing this Spirit within us, by putting His love within us so that we might love the Father and the Son and that they might love us and that we might be bound together by the same Spirit of love by which the Trinity is bound together. That's the, the love that the Spirit of God gives. I really can't think of a greater blessing than that. It's beyond comprehension that He would grant to us of His Holy Spirit so that we would be one, that we as a body would be one, even as Jesus and the Father are one. They're not one person, but 
they're one in purpose and they're one in their love and so forth, that they also may be in us, that is, that we may be in them in this relationship, bound together by the same Holy Spirit, and ultimately again so that the world may believe that you sent me. That is what Jesus has to give, and that's what he gives to all who will trust in him, and that is what he has given to us if we have trusted him and turn from our sins. We don't become God. We don't become part of the Godhead. Our essential nature is the same. We're still human beings. We don't become divine, but we do have the divine nature within us. As Peter says in one of his two letters, we are partakers of the divine nature. The Spirit of God dwells within us, and that nature is his love of what is good and right, his love of holiness, his love of perfection. That's what binds us together with Him and creates that intimacy that we have with the Lord. Now, we are going to see more about that as we go through this um, prayer, but let's, let's think about that and let's realize what a great honor and blessing the Lord has given to us. And again, let's remember it's all because of what Jesus Christ has done. It only comes through Him. He is the source. He is the fountain. Well, let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's thank Him, praise Him, bless Him for this great blessing.